Hi, I'm the Smeghead, and welcome to another episode of Cinematic Excrement. Today I'll be talking about a film that I discovered completely by accident while wandering through one of the few video stores that hasn't been put out of business by Netflix or Redbox. The film is called Princess of Mars, and it was produced by The Asylum. Now if you haven't heard of The Asylum, it's a film studio that is famous for making what are commonly known as mockbusters. Basically, when a major Hollywood studio is set to release a film that is expected to do well, they make their own crappy, low-budget version of the film and release it direct to DVD, usually on the same day, in the hopes that somebody will rent or buy their film by accident. Some of their previous works include Transmorphers, Snakes on a Train, and Paranormal Entity. Obviously, those were designed to rip off Transformers, Snakes on a Plane, and Paranormal Activity. But with Princess of Mars, it's not immediately apparent what movie they're trying to rip off based on the title. So let's take a closer look at the DVD cover. There are a few things that stand out here. First of all, judging by this line on the right, the Hollywood film they're targeting here is James Cameron's Avatar. And this line above the title tells us it's based on a novel by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Cameron did mention in an interview that he took some inspiration from Burroughs' Barsoom series. And the first book in that series was called A Princess of Mars. I guess the Asylum's budget didn't allow for the A in the title. Anyway, flipping over to the back cover, we see a staple of many Asylum videos. The unsighted quote. Who said it? It could have been an actual movie critic, but it also could have been the director. Hell, for all I know, it could have been the pizza delivery guy. In any case, whoever said it is apparently trying to compare this movie with Starship Troopers and The Lord of the Rings. Wow, they're setting the bar pretty high here. Could they actually live up to those expectations? Well, let's find out. We start off with a shot of some snowy mountains, which has absolutely nothing to do with the movie and we'll never see them again. Behold, the power of stock footage! Then we're introduced to John Carter, played by Antonio Sabato Jr. I actually hadn't heard of him before seeing this movie, but apparently he'd made a name for himself acting in soap operas. And yes, his acting ability is about what you would expect from a soap opera star. We see him crouch down in these bushes with his sniper rifle and a dish towel on his head, don't ask me why, and trying very hard not to be seen. Until he suddenly sits up for no reason. I think Mr. Carter needs a refresher course in how not to be seen. This is Mr. E. R. Bradsaw of Maple Court, Black Lion Road, South East 5. He cannot be seen. Now, I'm going to ask him to stand up. Mr. Bradsaw, will you stand up, please? <laughs> this demonstrates the value of not being seen. Anyway, John goes into some tea shop, which in reality is probably the director's kitchen, and he and the shop's owner, Sarka, have a pointless conversation. Many people pop through this area. It's not sharing season. And the poppies haven't harvested yet. Wait, play that again. Many people pop through this area. It's not sharing season. Wow. He can speak without moving his lips. That's a neat trick. Or a massive failure in ADR. Later on, Sarka gets captured for no apparent reason, so John tries to rescue him by threatening to set off a bomb if they don't let him go. They agree to release him, but suddenly, Sarka pulls a gun. <laughs> oh boy, here we go again. It's a trap! So a brief firefight ensues, and it ends with both John and Sarka shooting each other. John blacks out and wakes up in some military hospital, barely clinging to life, as a couple of guys in camos explain what their plans are. You're probably wondering what your prognosis is. You're not expected to make it through the night. You are suffering from a condition known as foramencopitis, commonly known as you have a fucking hole in your head syndrome. As you may have guessed, it's typically fatal. All of your major systems are failing, but that's okay. Because we really didn't like you anyway. No, actually, it's because they apparently have the ability to reconstruct his entire body atom by atom, and they're going to send John with his new body to a planet called Mars. Not the Mars that you think. This is Mars 216, a small planet in the orbit Alpha Centauri, the fourth planet out from its sun. Our scans show an exceeding possibility that this planet could hold life. We certainly believe it has an atmosphere. True, we don't really know for sure, but we're going to send you there anyway, knowing full well that you could die instantly upon your arrival. Have fun! Well, that was uncalled for. 
So they transmit John Carter into his newly constructed body on Mars, and this is about the only point where the movie even comes close to resembling Avatar. He arrives semi-conscious in the presence of some masked man and a Princess Leia cosplayer known as Deja Thoris, played by former porn star Tracy Lords. And yes, her acting ability is about what you would expect from a former porn star. Get used to that expression on her face. It's the only one she has in the entire movie. Not even joking. He can do us no harm now. You are making a big mistake, my princess. Wow. I don't know who they think they're fooling with that mask. That's obviously Sarka. I don't know what the fuck he's doing on Mars, but it's obviously him. Anyway, they decide to leave him there, and he wakes up sometime later, alone and naked in the middle of the desert. Yeah. That went well. John quickly discovers that this planet's gravity is significantly weaker than Earth's. <laughs> wow, I'm just, wow. I mean, there's low budgets, and then there's cheating. That was fucking cheating. And it wouldn't be so bad if they did it sparingly, you know, showcase your strengths, minimize your weaknesses, but no. They do this again, and again, and again. A few jumps later, John thankfully finds himself a towel to wear, but he is then ambushed by some alien beings known as Tharks. This is either a really good sign or a really, really bad one. It's a good sign or it's a bad sign. Well, thank you, Captain Obvious. I don't know where we'd be without you. So they capture him and start taking him... Uh somewhere, but along the way to somewhere, they're attacked by giant ants. During the battle, one of the Tharks decides to set John free. He starts to run away, but then he has a change of heart and goes back to help his former captors. With his help, they manage to slaughter all of the giant insects, even though they only manage to shoot a handful of them on screen. I guess the rest of the ants committed suicide out of shame upon realizing they were in an asylum movie. Can't blame them. With the battle won, they head for a Thark outpost where they offer John some of their fine cuisine. He politely declines, but after some encouragement, some sharp, pointy encouragement, he agrees to eat one of the bugs. Then, much to his surprise, one of the Tharks starts speaking English. Now that we have your attention, allow me to introduce myself again. I am Tars Tarkas. There was something in that bug, right? Yes. The Jubilee Beetle allows all to communicate. Cough, Hitchhiker's Guide, cough. Am I free to go? You have earned your position amongst us. As our tradition, you are often the things of the warrior you defeated on the first day. Um, your mask is sticking out of your shirt there. You might want to tuck that in. This conversation doesn't last as it is interrupted by yet another battle, this time with a ship full of humans. The ship sustains significant damage and casualties during the fight and begins to retreat, so John decides to leap after it and get a closer look. On the ship, we see the Princess and Sarka, along with two other humans. The Princess takes off on a speeder bike that appears to have been stolen from Return of the Jedi. After she leaves, Sarka shoots the other two humans for reasons that are never really explained and leaves on the other bike. John then leaps onto the ship, and the man begs John to hide him and his wife because if the Tharks find them, they will desecrate their bodies. John agrees, and once they are in a safe place, the man identifies himself as Kantos Khan. And if Kantos Khan cook, so can you. Kantos begs John to protect the princess, and mentions something about a royal pumping station. Remember this, day by day, night by night, we keep the air clean and bright. Day by day, night by night, we keep the air clean and bright. Day by day, night by night, we keep the air clean. Right. Stop saying that! What the hell is that supposed to mean, anyway? We keep the air clean and bright? How is air supposed to be bright? It's transparent. You know, unless you live in Los Angeles. That night, John tracks down the princess, don't ask me how, and tries to convince her that he's on her side. I promise you, I'm not gonna give you up to a bunch of bloodthirsty tharks.
damage will affect me later. Uh, somehow I doubt that. So after swearing that he wouldn't give her up to the Tharks, his next step is to... give her up to the Tharks. Our hero, ladies and gentlemen. Let me explain. It's not what you think. I'm still on your side. Punching you in the face and turning you over to your enemies is just my way of saying I like you.